Um, just before getting going, though, I was, I was thinking about this um, this morning as as we're coming together in a virtual context, um, and about all the movement that is not happening right now. There was a report earlier on, uh, maybe I'm three weeks ago now, about uh, how much greenhouse gas emissions had dropped in China in particularly, but also now all over the place because we're just driving around a lot less. There's still obviously trucks and some public transportation moving around, but for with so many people staying at home, there's a lot less use of petroleum. And of course, it'll come back as soon as we all get back on the roads again. But one of the bizarre benefits of this very strange time is that uh, we're just polluting the environment a lot less. And I think it really ties into this course in many interesting ways. Yeah, it's good for the environment, shockingly. Um, but one of the things I said earlier on in this course is that we, part of our unsustainable food practices have to do with the fact that we move things around a lot. We move food around enormously. You know, it comes from thousands of kilometers away very often. We move our bodies around. We move to the grocery stores to buy large quantities very often in a car if you live in the suburbs. Um, but even if not, we move around a lot. We also don't necessarily shop very efficiently because we know we always have access. We can always go out to the grocery store. And so that also leads to waste, overconsumption, waste, all sorts of things. And so in these, you know, really difficult times of isolation and often social isolation as well as physical isolation, there's also something going on about more sustainability. And it, to me, it's about um, not moving around so much and being close, staying closer to home, which 400 years ago was normal. Everyone stayed close to home because there wasn't a lot of a lot of uh, transportation going on. I mean, you might have you might have moved around a little bit, but you certainly weren't easily traveling from one country to another, and your food wasn't coming from far away either. So, just in a in an interesting sense, this is a good reminder of where sustainability falls apart very often because of convenience, because of movement, because of transportation. Um, yeah, so I was thinking about that too because I also know I'm. I waste very little food, but I'm wasting very little food right now because I'm not going out to buy it whenever I want. So I actually have to be really careful with what I eat and cook and save. And so that's been an interesting process, too. Anyway, um, we can have some chat about that uh, later on. And given that this is all kind of a weird format because I can't really see you or your faces or whether you're raising your hands or whether you're falling asleep, um, I'm going to depend on you to let me know if I'm talking too fast or if a slide isn't working or if you don't understand something. So do use the chat. Um, I'll see those messages come up um, and we can use that as a way of uh, having this be a bit more of a conversation than usual, even though it's really only me that's talking right now. So use the chat. Um, I sort of see when you raise your hand. So there's this little option in the bottom of the screen that says raise hand. You can do that. Um, I may or may not notice, but just feel free because we're a small enough group to put your comments into the chat. Or if you want to say something out loud, you can unmute, unmute yourself and then just talk out loud because that's also nice to hear your voices sometimes. Um, so do that. Um, let me know again if, if anything's not working or if you're not seeing something. I've now just, I just taught this class this morning, so it seems to be going okay, but, uh, but do check in if anything's not working. And so what I want to do, uh, there's a lot to go through, um, including I want to go through quickly the, the revised course outline because there's some changes, including to the assignments. Um, so I want to make sure that's really clear. And there's still some questions up in the air that we're figuring out as the teachers of this course. There are a few of us who are trying to figure out, particularly having to do with the final exam. So I'll tell you about that. And then we've got a couple of points from week two um, that I want to cover. And then we're also going to look at all the content or most of the content from week three and week four today, because we're having to compress things of having lost last week as a, as a teaching time. So that's where we're going. Um, that's uh, that's quite a lot. So we'll I'll try to make sure that we take the break at the usual time. Um, well, of course, no one's going outside for a smoke right now, so um, it will probably be a bit, about a 10-minute break. But of course, you're free to <clears throat> take a pause if you need to. 
I'm losing my voice, as you can tell, so I'll be drinking my lemon water. <clears throat> so again, if, if something is not clear, just let me know. Um, all right, so I'm going to switch over to the outline, the course outline, which I want to just walk through. There's not too much that's changed, but there are a couple of key things. So this is posted on Blackboard. Um, I did make announcements about the main changes in Blackboard, so keep your eye on those announcements. Uh, just check in every once in a while to make sure that there's nothing that's coming that you're unaware of. Uh, the major issues, uh, so there you can see, is anybody not seeing the shared screen with the revised uh, syllabus right now? If you're not, raise your hand or say something in chat. But what uh, is notable, obviously, is the classes were canceled last week. So that means we press the rest of the course into uh, the remaining time. Other major issue is that the pledge assignment is no longer part of this course. Now, I know some of you have already submitted the pledge assignment. Um, I saw that in the grading section of Blackboard. So um, we'll find another solution for you. But if you have not, if you didn't see the notice, um, that the pledge assignment has been canceled. Now you know. Um, and for those of you who did it, don't worry about it. We'll sort out another solution. Um, the pledge assignment is basically replaced by three very small exercises that we will do in the class in this week and then in the coming two weeks. So, um, and I'll explain this again when we get there. If you did the pledge assignment, and there are a few of you who did, you do not need to do the in class exercises. Um, but you can if you choose to do them, and then I will take the better mark uh, too. So either you can you can not do sorry I'm not explaining this very well. If you did the pledge assignment, I will grade it, and you will receive a mark. If you also want to do the in class exercises, you can do those, submit them. And they're quite light and simple, and then I will just take the better mark either of the pledge assignment or the in class exercises. Um, and then if you haven't done the pledge assignment already, um, then you will have to do the in-class exercises to get those points. So we just rearrange things so that you still get your, your full evaluation for the course, but it's broken up into some, um, some smaller pieces. Um, so there will be one of those exercises today. Uh, we'll do it after the break. Um, quite a light a little quiz, but it's, it's not going to be very complicated. And then we will have uh, two similar kind of exercises in week five next week and week six, the week after, and, and then week seven, something else. So as you can see, we are right now here, week four. We're looking at both policy and profit today. Um, next week, we'll get into the topic of food systems. So that's looking at systems more broadly and how they have changed over the millennia. And then next week, sorry, the week after that, week six, we're going to get into the question of ethics, but also some review for the final exam. Uh, now, the final exam is no longer taking place in the George Brown Evaluation Center, obviously, because the college is closed. But there will be a different kind of exam, and it will be taken during class time in week seven. So right now, again, we're trying to figure out how to rewrite that exam so that it is appropriate for this revised version of the course. Um, I'm probably having a meeting either tomorrow or the next day or next week with the other instructors in this class to figure out what that exam will look like. But it'll probably be short answers and multiple choice. And you'll do it during class time, so this time on week seven, and just send it to me by email. Or it might be something that we can put on Blackboard. We're still figuring that out. It's still worth 20% of the final mark, um, but you'll be doing it in class in week seven. And other than that, the other major change is that the checklist assignment is now due week six. So if you're not, we did go through that quite a lot uh, a couple of weeks ago, but if you still have questions about the checklist assignment, we can talk about that today. So I'll check in at the end of the class about whether you need some time on that. So that's the, those are the main changes uh, to the course outline. And really, we, as instructors at George Brown, are trying to do is get you through the semester, teach you as much as is possible, um, have you graduate if you're graduating, or at least complete all your course assignments, 
Um, it's obviously a pretty crazy time. Um, so we're figuring out things as we go. And there were a lot of meetings last week to do that figuring out. Um, but you know, our objective is to make sure that you're, first of all, taking care of yourselves, and second of all, getting through uh, without too much pain. Any questions on what I've just talked about in terms of the course outline? Is anything not clear? And if it is, if there is anything, just this is a good time to pose a question in chat. Okay, if, thank you, all clear, Miriam. If anything is not clear or if something comes to you as usual, email me or just put it in the chat right now so I can respond to it today. All right. <clears throat> yeah, okay, so I'll go through the checklist assignment again, um, save some time for that at the end of the class. All right. So, I want to just step back to week two because there were a couple of just a couple of little points in that class that were maybe oh no no they didn't, didn't cover not that they weren't clear but I just remember I, I wasn't talking about them very much and so I'll start with this um, the idea that Joshna Maharaj who's this very interesting woman in Toronto um, she's all about connecting food to a larger set of community relationships. And she's worked a lot in institutional food service, so in hospitals and schools, um, but also in prisons and in other places where food is served to a large number of people um, in their institution. So you can imagine, I mean, as you know, in school, uh, whether it's a, a college or a high school or a university, uh, food is often not that great. Now at George Brown, it's a different question, of course. But in a lot of places, the food is is pretty uh, pretty cheap in terms of quality, not very good quality, and not very delicious and often not very varied. And that's certainly a problem in hospitals where food is, um, you know, it's, it's very often it's a question of cost, but it's also a question of you know, keeping, reducing the amount of salt and fat and sugar for people who are on, on diets because of some medical condition. But that also means that the food is also not very interesting sometimes. And it's been shown through a lot of research that if food is good in a hospital, if people are enjoying eating their food, they actually heal faster. So they get better from whatever surgery or disease they have because the food is improving their mental and emotional health. So Joshna took this on as a, as a really specific uh, and very important project because she was recognizing that in these institutional contexts, if the food's bad, the rest of it's bad. If the food is bad in a school, the learning is bad. If the food is bad in a hospital, the healing is bad. And then in prisons as well, where food is very often a really important part of the day and where people are coming from a wide range of different backgrounds, culturally and socioeconomically, food is really important because it keeps morale going. And just because you're a prisoner doesn't mean that you shouldn't be well fed and fed with cultural appropriateness. So all of this is what Joshna is interested in working in. And the reason that she's, she's saying this is important is that it's about a connection to not only uh, like nutrition and basic, basic needs, but it's a connection, what she says, it ties us to a place, it ties us to our community and our society, and that eating locally isn't just about reducing the carbon footprint of your food, it's actually about feeling a sense of identity and a sense of belonging and a sense of connectivity to the people that we're with. And that's maybe not so intuitive, but if you think about eating with your family versus eating with a bunch of friends, if you're eating familiar foods in your family, it reinforces the way you feel, reinforces the connections that you have to that, those people, but also to the home and even ultimately to yourself. When you eat things outside of your own culture, you're often feeling a sense of disconnection. And right now, all of us are feeling a sense of disconnection from our societies, whether or not we're eating our normal food. Um, and it's painful. It's painful to be so socially isolated. And social isolation also comes from not eating the food that is familiar to you. So she thinks about food in this very important, big, connected sense. 
And she's listed in, on her website these different benefits of better food relationships. And it's some, of, some of them tie very specifically to sustainability in the way we've been talking about. So she talks about the joy of cooking and eating together. Well, and joy is a kind of cultural sustainability or individual sustainability. If you feel joy, that allows you to live on to the next day. It allows you to celebrate and make plans. It speaks to the sort of the importance of the individual. Um, youth armed with cooking skills and a pocket of family recipes. This is another one of her benefits of, of better food relationships. That's about intergenerational um, sustainability. So about making sure that knowledge from one generation, say grandparents, gets transferred to the next. Um, farmers earning a good, reliable living. Obviously, that's economic sustainability, but that also means that if a farmer is taking care of his or her land, we've got some environmental sustainability going on. And then same kind of thing, agricultural land that's renewed by ecological growing and gratitude. And this is a this comes back to what we were talking about two weeks ago in terms of indigenous food systems, that having gratitude for the land, being grateful that the land exists and helps you produce food is a way to help sustain the land because it builds a relationship. And now it may seem strange to have a relationship with a piece of land, but that is what people who work on the land have. And it's historically, it's, it's what indigenous communities felt very strongly is that this place was not just a place that they're extracting vegetables and animal products from. They were actually having a relationship with that place. And by having a relationship with it, they wanted to take care of it. And by taking care of it, it took care of them. So it's really this multi-way relationship. And centered in that relationship is this idea of gratitude, of being grateful to the environment. And then Joshna's final main point is that um, a community grows stronger by having connections through food. And so that's about social sustainability and about relationships that allow us to grow, to celebrate, to actually be well in our communities. Now, all of this relates to this main theme that I wanted to come to in this particular class, which is the notion of the community food center. And <clears throat> community food centers are an evolution of what we have called in the past food banks. And there still are food banks, and food banks are very important centers where people who uh, don't have the economic means to purchase their own food can go and receive a basket or a box of free food. And sometimes it's once a week, sometimes it's once a month, it depends on the food bank. Food banks are really important because they fill in a gap um, and they help people who don't have access, who don't have the money to buy food. Um, very, very important. Uh, but at the same time, they don't always deal with all of the issues that food is related to. So yeah, the food bank will provide free food, and the food comes from donations, either from individuals or from businesses. Um, and so that's the way that the food can be free. But very often it's not the most interesting food, it's the food that they receive from donations. And because they operate maybe once a week or twice a week or once a month, the food also has to be shelf stable. So it basically has to be packaged foods. And a lot of food banks aren't able to deal with fresh fruits and vegetables, fresh dairy, meat, maybe um, things that can survive for a while. But fresh fruits and vegetables are very hard to keep fresh and in the food bank context. So food banks are good, um, but they're not always addressing all of the issues that come with not having the economic means to buy food. And so that's where the food center, the community food center, became a new idea. Uh, Community Food Centers Canada is actually an organization that operates a bunch of different food centers across the country. And what they do is they, yes, they give free food away, but they also work with people to help them connect to their community, help them meet their neighbors, make friends, uh, learn about cooking the food that comes in their box, uh, learn about growing food, learning about how food is connected to health and um, and pride and, and dignity. And so a lot of this, so this map that we're looking at right now sort of demonstrates that food, community food centers uh, are thinking about food in a way that's a bit broader than the way food banks deal with it. So 
they deal with education so things like learning how to cook if you're if you're um receiving free food and it's packaged food you have to cook it at some point but if you don't have culinary skills then that food's not so useful but it's also about things like equality and engagement making sure that people of all classes can have access to the learning to the food and engagement getting involved so the food center the community food center is not just a place where you go you grab your box of food and you leave you might stay there for a while you might stay there for an hour and take a class you might stay there and socialize with people you might get some counseling from maybe a jobs counselor you might have uh resources that help you find an apartment or a home if you're if you're living either in a precarious situation or you don't have a home. So the community food center is trying to address all of these issues at once, making it dignified and hopeful to receive this food rather than for some people who can't afford food, it's kind of shameful to have to ask for help. I know when I have to ask for help about anything, whether it's receiving food or receiving assistance of any kind, it's it's very difficult for me. And so imagine if you are someone who doesn't have the money to buy food, it can be very challenging in terms of the emotional. So the community food center is addressing that as well. And things like health and how health is related to food and how we can have a community support us in some of these issues um, that have to do that with the, all of the other conditions that a person is living in who might not have access to food. So that's what the, the community food center is really thinking about holistic needs. Um, and not just nutritional needs. And then this is some of the numbers that demonstrate the, the positive impact of community food centers. Um, <clears throat> so that 92% of the people who were surveyed in this which said that their community food center is an important source of healthy food. Some people say they've made healthy changes to their diets, 80% of people who visit. 55% um, of people say they've experienced improvements in their physical health, 70% improvements in their mental health, and then the people can make friends or meet someone that they can count on in a time of need. So it's really about this, this holistic view of, of how food plays an important role in connecting us in our lives. Um, so the Community Food Centers of Canada is one organization. There are lots of smaller ones. Um, there's one here in Montreal. It's actually not that small, but it's local to Montreal. It's independent called Centre Paul Roulant. And Centre Paul started as a cafe and basically a Meals on Wheels organization. Meals on Wheels are basic is a it's a it's a it's a what it's a community organization that um, makes food, prepares it, cooks it, and then packages it up and takes it to people who are in their apartments or houses who can't get out. So that's right now that's all of us. But um, before COVID. Uh, people who were either chronically ill or older people who had mobility issues or anybody who just can't leave their house for one reason or, or another, of course, can't go out and buy, shoot, buy food and cook it and bring it home and cook it. So Meals on Wheels is a way to get cooked, healthful food out to people who are in their homes. So this was the cafe and the Meals on Wheels nonprofit organization. But because Centropole was Centropole, they decided to do all this on bicycles rather than on in cars. And that's very practical because the neighborhood that Centropole is in is very urban. There's not a lot of space for parking. And so bicycles are both more sustainable and also more, um, more useful because they can, you can park them more easily. So then they had bikes and Meals on Wheels and a cafe, and they added a bike shop, a community bike shop, where you could come and fix your bike and talk with other people who are interested in biking, and then maybe volunteer as a bike delivery person of the food. So they started growing in this organic way. And they now have a much bigger building that they're occupying. It's got a commercial kitchen in it. They have a rooftop garden. They have, uh, they have beehives on top of their rooftop as well. So they're growing food, they're producing food, they're selling food, they're cooking food, they're delivering food. And this is a, this other kind of approach to healthy, people healthy food um, and now their the latest project is to take people from the city out into the country so they can learn how food is actually grown so there are now workshops and training programs on agriculture and farming so in the same way we saw last week or two weeks ago this idea of food sovereignty so food sovereignty different from food security in that it includes yes healthy and culturally appropriate food but it's also produced through ecological and sustainable methods. 
And then most importantly in food sovereignty, it's the right to define your own food and define your own food systems so that it's about control and power over the way that food is made and processed and delivered in your community. Not just having access to food, not just calories, but control and control of appropriate food. So that's food sovereignty, and that really relates to what food community centers are trying to do. So in the same way that it's not just about a food bank delivering calories to people in need, but it's a few other things. It's a welcoming space, so it's a space that people might want to stay for a while, where people can grow, cook, and share food. So it's not just about receiving free food, but learning how to do something with it. It's a place of advocacy, so it's about making change in the world. And importantly, it's high quality food that's delivered in a dignified space, in a space that people can go into and feel comfortable and feel proud and feel connected. So it's taking this idea of the food bank to the next level because it's a more through a more holistic way of thinking about um, providing food access. So that's just uh, wanted to <clears throat> come back to that because it's it's this in this layering together of ideas in the same way that Santropol layered on different aspects of its, its organization over time. The food center is really about layering on other benefits, other tools, and other points of connection. Um, so it's not just the food, but everything that the food belongs to, and that's where it's sustainable. That's why because it's about creating sustainable accessibility to food, not just accessibility. Does that make, I hope that makes sense. Um, any questions about food centers, community food centers versus food banks, or any other questions? No? OK. If anything comes up, feel free to pop those questions into the chat. Thanks, Pratik. All right, moving on. <clears throat> Policy. Okay, so policy is a sort of interesting, uh, weird beast. It's a way to participate. Um, it's a good question. Um, you can certainly pose questions anytime, and I will answer them. Um, in the next section, there's going to be a bit more of a bit more participation, but um, there will be some questions that I will pose, and maybe you can respond to those questions yourselves in the chat. <clears throat> I'll try to make sure it's a little bit more you talking than me, but <laughs> this is all a learning process for me. This is only the second time I've given a class online. All right, so in in policy. Um, there are a lot of different pieces that come together. And policies, you know, we talk about policies, we, we hear the word policy, but it's a kind of funny thing because it's a bit abstract for most of us. Most of us don't have policies in our, or we don't deal with policy directly in our lives. But there are policies that are present everywhere. So here's an opportunity to participate. Um, what policies are you aware of in your personal life right now, for example? Is anyone here walking around on the street on their phone in a group of five people listening to this lecture? No, 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 okay, so why not? Why are we not all in a classroom together right now? Yep, so at this point, the entire province of Ontario has enacted a policy that people can't assemble in groups, and that businesses that are not uh, critical to the economy, like education, um, have to shut down. So the college is shut down. We're still organizing the classes because we believe that's important. But the policy that the government of Ontario just enacted was 
shut all non-required services down and nobody can assemble and you should stay in your home. There's some more, uh, even more forceful policies in place right now. The federal government has uh, enacted or has put into action the, the Quarantine Act. And so it is now not just a policy, but it is a legal requirement for you, if you've been traveling outside the country, for you to go immediately to your home as soon as you cross the border and stay there for 14 days, right? Yeah, and you can be arrested or fined for not following that rule, that policy that the government enacted. So policies are created by governments, but they're also created by um, organizations. Well, there, yeah, there's another question. Yeah, it's okay to go out for walks, but the standard is that you go out by yourself. <clears throat> you're not allowed to go in groups. Um, and if you're outside, you want to be staying, or with your dog, yeah, but you want to be staying at least two meters away from any other person. And that policy is been expressed, but it hasn't been necessarily written down. That's what we're calling social distancing or physical distancing. And this is basically a public health policy that is being communicated to us in order to change our behavior, in order to keep us from having close contact with other people so as to reduce the spread of the virus. So policies are sometimes created at the federal level, at the governmental level of the, of the country. Sometimes they're created at the provincial level. Sometimes they're created just at the institutional level, like George Brown has lots of policies. They're written down and they're communicated to you in different ways, basically as PDFs on the website somewhere. Um, but then at the even personal level, some families might have policies in regular times, like no using your cell phone at the dinner table, or you're only allowed two hours of screen time a day or everybody eats together um, at breakfast, but we have lunch separately. So those are much more informal policies, but they're kind of the same thing. And a so a policy is basically a rule or a plan to accomplish a desired outcome or to structure behavior in such a way as to achieve a desired outcome. And policies are very often created in order to address a problem. So right now we've got pandemic, that's a problem. And so we have all of these different policies being created and they're being created very quickly in order to deal with the problem of transmission and the health services not being able to keep up and all these other things. So this is where policy actually becomes very meaningful to each one of us in some way. Um, and then there's tons of different policies that have already been created to deal with food and sustainability and water and all of the related science and technologies that are part of agriculture and part of food processing. So that's why that's why policy is so important because it's it's all there's lots of it in place and very often new policies are ways to deal with new problems. So we'll get into this with this discussion on policy now. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Just running out of voice. All right, <clears throat> so just a few um, a few slides to set the stage for policy. And these are, again, not the most cheerful of slides, but they are, are useful to recognize why policies are important. So on this slide, it just shows you the what we call the feed conversion ratio of different uh, plant, or I guess in this case, all animal production. So feed conversion ratio is the amount of food that you need to give an animal in order to produce an amount of edible product, meat, or in, in some cases, other things. And so down here, the slide's not great quality, but you can see the feed conversion ratio is what they say is the kilograms of food divided by the kilograms of edible weight. And so a lower feed conversion ratio is a more sustainable feed conversion ratio. So in the examples that are given, milk, for example, has a feed conversion ratio of 0 0.7, very efficient. It means that one kilogram of feed given to a cow 
will, sorry, means that 0.7 kilograms of feed given to a cow will produce one kilogram of milk. So that's quite low in terms of conversion ratios. For fish, it's more like two and a half grams of fish food to produce one kilogram of edible fish. Chicken, much more, 4.2. Pork, again, more, 10.7. And beef, 31.7. That means that 31.7 kilograms of feed go into creating every one kilogram of beef. And that's why we talk about beef production, cattle production, being so unsustainable, because it really takes a huge amount of, of animal food to create a small amount of human food. Um, now, this is just the feed, right? We're not talking about water. We're not talking about waste. We're not talking about all the other things that make uh, beef production sustainable. But you can see on this, this chart, you know, there's the curve that some things like liquid dairy, more sustainable in terms of the feed conversion ratio and bigger and bigger animals are less sustainable. And then meat also is about power and access and economic wealth. And so if you see in, in this, in this image, um, obviously, it's the, the more wealthy countries, Canada, the United States, uh, what's this down here, Argentina and Chile, Australia, New Zealand, Spain, but then all of Europe. These are the big meat eating regions of the world and much less meat eaten in places like most of Africa, India and Indonesia. And some of that is because of uh, religious practices and, and places that don't certainly India is not a big beef eating country and most uh, areas of the world uh, where Islam is the main religion are not pork eating countries so we've got a lot less meat being eaten in certain regions but China and Russia very big in pork consumption uh, and pork is, is eaten in, in a lot of places in Asia but also all around the world so you can just see that meat is very unevenly distributed around the world. And that's an important thing to remember because when we think about sustainability and animal production, it's not the same in every country. And it's in fact very, very different. So I want to look at, um, I'm going to come back to these definitions, but I want to look at a slide that shows um, some photographs of what the world eats uh, or what, what different people around the world eat in uh, a week. And so I'm going to share another screen with you. There we go. And so these are images from, is anybody not seeing this new screen with the Guardian photographs, Hungry Planet, What the World Eats in Pictures? OK, so I'm assuming you're all seeing it. Great. And so what this uh, photojournalist has done is take a picture of families in different parts of the world and in front of them, the amount of food that they eat in a week, including the cost of that food. So we'll come back to this family from Darfur in a second. But <clears throat> so I'm just going to scroll through these. Um, all the figures are given in uh, British pounds. But if you double that, you get sort of an American, North American dollar, although the dollar is a bit rich these days. Anyway, so here this is a British family from Wiltshire, and there's their food. You can see there's a lot of candy, single bottle of wine, a um, lot of packaged food, a lot of processed food, and some fruits and vegetables as well. But that family or eats that amount of food in a week, and they spent about $320 on it. So here's the family from, from Darfur in the Sudan and they're uh, a refugee family in a camp there, and they're actually in Chad right now, but they're from Darfur. Their weekly food consists of these three bags of what I think is rice and two different kinds of legumes or pulses, so they might be peas or beans of some sort, and a small amount of other ingredients, including some cooking oil, I think some limes there and some presumably some other things that give this food flavor. So some spices, some chilies. So this family of six, their food costs about a dollar fifty or a dollar eighty 
per week. It's very low cost, it's very minimal food, but they're obviously, if they're refugees in a camp in Chad, they're also not very socioeconomically well off. This family, uh, Japanese family of three, um, again, very different looking food to the Brits in that there's a lot more fresh vegetables, a lot of packaged fish, but not too much packaged food overall. And they're spending about $280 a week. There's a family in Ecuador, a much larger family, all of their food costing about $40 a week. And again, you can see no processed food whatsoever, maybe some cooking oil, but almost everything else is a lot, well, a lot of plantains and a lot of uh, root vegetables and plenty of grains and beans. And here's a family from uh, Mongolia, very, very meat focused, it looks like, meat, eggs, bread, but their food is costing them about $60, 6 0. Um, so again, not very high cost food, uh, but a very different style of food than the others. There's a family in Bosnia where all I see is bread and potatoes, but also again, meat, a certain amount of packaged food. Total for the week is about uh, $210. Family from Greenland, very little fresh fruits and vegetables. In fact, I don't see any fresh fruits and vegetables, but there's some wild food here. There's clearly some hunting going on in this family. Um, and yet their food is quite expensive. It's about, uh, what, about $360 equivalent. Um, because, of course, in the north, and all sorts of places in the world, uh, food is more expensive because it often means it's traveling a longer distance. There's a very large family from Bhutan, looking, according to the stuff in their house and their clothing, that they're not, they're certainly not poor. Um, they don't seem to be eating a huge amount of food weekly. Um, but what's striking is that the cost of their food is about six or seven dollars. Um, and that's partly attributable to the fact that Bhutan as a country is a very progressive place and uh, food food prices are are one of the focuses. It's important for food to be accessible. So here's an Indian family, total cost of food about $50, very vegetable and fruit focused. Here's an American family from North Carolina, Total cost of their food is about $440, so quite a lot of cash, quite a lot of processed food, quite a lot of pizza, um, and an interesting mix of, yeah, some fruits and vegetables, a lot of, looks like a lot of juice in, in jars. And it goes on. Um, this is a family from Mali, total cost of their food, $32. Again, very similar to uh, the family from Darfur, where there's some cooking oil, a lot of grains, a lot of beans. Quite a large family, though, but only, say, $32 in expenditures. And then this family from Germany, $640 for all this food, um, including all the beer, uh, which is certainly very prominently figured, and a lot of processed food. But again, Germany being a highly industrialized country, um, industrial food is, is more likely, as well as higher cost of food, because very often those two things go together. So that's just a bit of a, a glance at some different, different, very different experiences, very different styles of family, very different kinds of food, um, very different levels of sustainability, and certainly very, very different um, costs overall. Any comments on that? I'm going to go back to the slides, but any comments on that? Because I always find those images incredibly striking about the difference between different kinds of foodways around the world. Yes, yeah, and so Pratik, you're saying, yeah, the cost, um, the cost very much depends on the area um, and the seasonality. If, again, like within, in Greenland, not much of a growing season for fruits and vegetables. So we see that um, certainly in the north of Canada as well, food is extremely expensive because it has to be transported there and transportation routes are not as quick and easy as they are in the southern parts of Canada. So the same thing would be true for parts of northern Europe, northern Asia, um, and anywhere that there's not food being grown and has to be transported, it's going to be more expensive. But there's some great images. There's another, I tried to get into it, but I'm, I don't have access to the, the web page. It's behind a paywall. Um, but the same thing for water. 
um, and you can Google this, like how much water does uh, a family use in a week? And in different places, it's really striking that it's so, so very different. Some places using very little water. Of course, in Canada, we use tons of water and are very often kind of wasteful of it. Yeah, and as, as, as you said, just it's, it's, it's very, very easy to just buy what's available and in front of you, whether it's good food or junk food, processed food or whole food. If we don't have it presented to us by the stores, how do we find it? And this is again where sustainability is about thinking behind what's being presented to you. And yeah, and, and that's the industry, but if you can work around the industry or work within the industry to also find other sources of food, that's that's the effort. That's the that's the big job ahead of us as sustainable food professionals. All right. Okay, back to <clears throat> slides. So a few definitions to be aware of. Some of these we've already looked at. Um, the food desert, which I will get into in a little bit. Questions of certification. Green space is actually supposed to be green washing, I think, not green space. That's a typo or just a mistake. And then things like food security, food insecurity, which we've also talked about a bit. But we'll we'll come back to these a little in, in some details. So we talked a little bit about policies and how policies uh, are created or who creates policies. So federal governments, provincial governments, institutions like George Brown, also families, and then maybe even individuals. It is my policy to wake up at seven o'clock every morning and have coffee and then, so that's a habit, but if you reinforce it with a statement like that, it can become a policy, a personal policy. Um, and personal policies are also ways that we keep control over our behaviors, uh, that we tell other people about what we believe in, um, and that we reinforce those habits that we think are important. So policies can be created at very different levels. The policies overall have to do with rights, the right to something, the right to whatever, uh, the right to education, the right to uh, protection from violence, the right to vote, all sorts of things that we have in North America and in lots of countries around the world. Um, we have because we have had policies enacted to protect our rights. But rights are not necessarily available to everybody just because they're born into the world as a human being. Humans don't inherently have rights. Rights have to be created and then protected for people. And so it's really very dependent on the society that you're born into, what kinds of rights you have, and what kind of rights that you have are actually protected by some sort of policy. So if we look at this link, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, um, whoops, need to share my screen with you again. So this is the, uh, FAO, or the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and their statements about the right to food and how that fits into a larger set of rights that were agreed to by the UN in 1948. And so in this section, the key policy messages in the first bullet point says that in 1948, they established the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And in that Declaration of Human Rights, it was understood and recognized that the right to adequate food is, should be, is a legal obligation for every country to create for their citizens. Now, not every country does this, but the UN, as an organizational body, said that this should be true around the world. I'm actually gonna have you now watch a video. I won't stream it through um, I'll stream it through Blackboard because it'll take up too much bandwidth, but I'm going to send you the link. One second. 
So in the chat, I'm now dropping in the link to this video on YouTube. Uh, it's just a short video, but it does present why the FAO thinks the right to food is important. It's a three minute video. So as soon as I drop the link in, you can click on it and watch it. And then we will win three and a half minutes and talk about it. So there's the video. Uh, I'm going to shut down my audio and video and watch it myself. And now you can watch it at the same time. All right. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. Pratik, if you want to uh, <clears throat> check out and watch the video for a minute, that's fine. Um, 
But what was what I'd like to ask the rest of you who have seen the video now is what stood out from you from that video? What um, what did you notice or what was important to you that you remember from what the FAO, what those ex what those officials were saying about the importance of the right to food? What do you remember that made sense? Yeah, so Miriam, as you're saying, access to the food equally. So you mean that everybody in a given place should have equal access to the food? Yeah. And that, yeah, and as a human right, it's an interesting idea. It's not. It's not uh, shocking. Yes, everyone should be getting food, absolutely. And yet, of course, we know that around the world, about a billion people don't have enough food every day. And it's, as they said in the video, it's not because there's not enough food being produced, it's because it's not being distributed or shared appropriately or equally. Yeah, enough food. So it's really not, when we talk about sustainable food production towards feeding the 9 billion people who will be on the planet in about 20 or 30 years. It's not about making more. It's about making sure that it's available. And so med whether that's about reducing waste or improving distribution or thinking about access and fairness, those are solutions that are sustainable as opposed to just making more and continuing to waste it or not distribute it properly. But what I find amazing about this personally is it was in 1948 that the right to food was first recognized. And now, over time, since 2014, so 2004, the FAO member countries adopted the voluntary guidelines to support the right to food. So just because the right is, is named, it doesn't mean that there are policies in place that necessarily support that right being available to everybody. And so you can write, you can say it's a right. I have the right to walk down the street without people harassing me. You know, that should be your right. But it doesn't mean that people aren't going to harass you just because you've declared it to be a right. So what else do uh, those rights need in addition to the statement of the policy? What else, what else do we need for those rights to actually be available to people? This is a question for all of you. What do you think? I can't point at any of you and say, hey, answer. So it's not as easy as in the classroom. Yeah, this, the question is, what, just because uh, a right has been declared, like the right to food, what else needs to be done in order for that right to be realized, in order for that right to be actually um, lived by people? So if we say in 1948, everybody on the planet has the right to food, but it takes, but we still know that there are a billion people without food, what needs to be put in place, thinking about the subject of this class, which is policy? Yeah, so you need to put the rights into action. How do you do that? Yes, great, Bailey. So enforcement is a key part of any policy and, and education or communication. Education and communication may be in the same way. So in this slide that you're, we're now looking at, here are some, some elements of policy. But I'm going to say a few things that aren't written down. So time to pay attention, take some notes. So policies are plans. They're plans that are created to respond to a problem or an issue that people have recognized in the world. So in 1948, the FAO recognizes that there are people around the world who don't have enough food. So they create they, they, stay, they say that the right to food is a, it should be a right, and then they start building, by the time we get to it, policies to deal with that problem. So the policy is a plan. You could also call it a system of principles that guide decisions. 
You could say that it's a system of protocols or a set of rules that are agreed to. Um, so, it, or it could be a policy could be um, what a government says it will do. So these are all different kinds of ways of understanding what policy is. So policy is definitely something that is conceived of. So it's a plan. Then what else has to happen? Well, it has to be written down in some format so that everybody can agree to it and understand it in the same way. So that it's not interpretable um, differently by different groups. Then that written plan needs to be communicated. So that's about education or about communication. And you can't really educate or communicate a large number of people unless you write it down. So that's why policies tend to be written documents that are agreed to by a number of people and that are then distributed and communicated to a larger audience. And then after that, they need to be enforced. So you can create all the policies in the world, but if you don't have some sort of enforcement plan behind it, there's no guarantee that people will follow those policies. And so that's one of the things we're seeing right now in Canada in relation to the virus is that the government, the federal government of Canada just put into action a policy that had been, but that had not been activated. And it's called the Quarantine Act. And this is a law that requires people to quarantine themselves, in this case, after they've come back from outside the country. And so all these people who are returning from the south of the United States or other places that they were there for the winter now have to, as soon as they get back into Canada, go directly to their homes. Don't go grocery shopping. Don't go drop off your car at the garage to get it fixed. Don't pick up your dog. Don't visit your kids. None of those things are allowed now for people returning home from outside the country. And that's the new government policy on um, returning citizens to Canada. But it does have to be enforced. And so now the police or the RCMP or some policing body needs to go enforce that policy. So if they find someone who has come from the airport and stopped off at Walmart to buy a lot of groceries, they can be arrested. They can be fined for breaking that law. So enforcement is critical, but enforcement is not always easy depending on what the policy is trying to support. So in the case of the right to food, you can have a policy <clears throat> in a country that says everybody has the right to food, but how is that enforced? So if people are going hungry, first of all, do they know that they have the right to food? That's the education and communication part. And second of all, if they don't have the right to, if they don't have access to food, who do they go to to register a complaint so that they can then have that right enforced? And that's where the, the, the disconnects happen between the plan and the policy and the actual realization of the policy in the real world. Um, so, you know, I've got some other examples here also that are sort of interesting to think about. Um, think about George Brown. Does George Brown have a cannabis policy? What is the marijuana policy for George Brown College? Does anybody know? Does anybody know if you're allowed to smoke in the classroom, even if the classrooms are open? Right. So you can't smoke in the classroom. You can't smoke in the building. But you also can't smoke any other cigarettes. So there's no smoking of cannabis on campus. But there's also no smoking of cannabis or, or regular tobacco inside any building. And that's a policy enacted by the government of Canada. So George Brown's policy has to fit within that bigger policy as well. So even if George Brown thought, yeah, of course, everybody should smoke pot on campus, you still couldn't because the government's policy is the umbrella under which their policy has to sit as well. So within the government's policy, federal government says, we are allowed to purchase and consume marijuana products in Canada. But at the next level down, say the provincial policy, you have to be 18 years or older to buy it or in, in Quebec, you have to be 21 or older to buy it. And then you can't smoke it in certain places. You can't smoke it in public parks. You can't smoke it near um, near um, 
elementary schools or high schools. You can't smoke it in contexts where it might be spelled by other people. So there are additional layers of policy that get created for different institutions. Um, and those layers of policy have to fit within the other layers of policy. And that gets complicated also when we're talking about two countries trying to negotiate something. And I'm just gonna come to that slide somewhere. Maybe. Yeah. So um, historically, Canada and the United States and Mexico had a trade agreement called NAFTA, which is the North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, they just renegotiated it last year. It took a very long time, and it's now called the USMCA. Sometimes we still call it NAFTA, but NAFTA too. And the USMCA stands for the United States, Mexico, and Canada Agreement. So in that trade agreement, it's about what products we buy and sell from each other. But the different food policies in the different countries don't always line up with each other. So it has made it made the negotiation of this trade agreement very difficult because the food policies were not the same. And so some of the examples can be seen, for example, in the case of dairy products. In the United States, their policy is overproduction. So there's a huge amount of dairy, a surplus of dairy, created in the United States. Whereas in Canada, we have a system called supply management which controls the amount, the amount of dairy that's produced by the producers. But those two things don't work with each other. So in the United States, there's a surplus. In Canada, there's, well, there's a surplus, but there's basically the right amount being produced. But then there's some other issues. Like in the United States, dairy producers are allowed to use recombinant bovine growth hormone, which increases milk production in cows. And in Canada, there is no RGBH, RBGH allowed in dairy production. So those two systems also don't work because the RGB, RBGH is, is thought to be not very good for humans to consume. So if you've got milk coming into Canada from the United States, that milk doesn't fit within Canada's dairy policy. And so it makes the trade of milk between the two countries very challenging. So trade then has this effect to Sometimes, well, in the case of Canada, we've got the federal, the provincial, the municipal, and maybe the institutional level of policy. But then in relationships with another country, you'd have Canada's policy and the United States' policy. And in that case, there's like these big divides between the two, which make creating trade agreements very difficult. So that's one of the challenges that policy will run into. All right, I think now would probably be a good moment to take a little break in the classroom. I personally need to take a break and just rest my voice for a few minutes. Um, if you have questions about anything, you can pose them to me in the chat. Otherwise, I will say, why don't you come back, um, take a little break yourselves, get up and stretch, and uh, come back, and we'll start up again in 10 minutes. Uh, but if you do have questions, we can hang out and chat for a while. I'm going to turn off my audio and video for now, but um, feel free to send questions in the chat, and see you in 10 minutes.
So we'll get going another minute or two. I'm just uh, testing something out in the meantime. Okay. So just a <clears throat> quick question for those of you who are here. Um, as, as I think you know, I teach this class at, at from 9 until noon, just before we then get together at 1 o'clock. Um, and I was wondering if we might be able to combine the two classes. So this is a question for you. Does anyone here have a class on Thursdays from 9 till 12? Yes. OK. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, OK. So we'll just leave it as we had it. I just thought if we could combine everybody into one class, then it would be uh, a little bit uh, a little bit less trying on my voice. But we'll just uh, we'll keep it as it is. All right, that's what we thought. All right, so we're going to go on <clears throat> continuing a little bit on theory, and then we'll transfer over to the other subject today, which is which is profit. Um, and I also want to make sure we save some time to talk about the uh, checklist assignment, any questions that you have. So as you heard in the FAO video, one of their models, the United Nations models for making policies, is what they call this Panther mo model. And that's just an acronym for these words on screen right now, participation, Accountability, non-discrimination, transparency, human dignity, empowerment, and the rule of law. And so this is what the what the UN recommends as necessary for creating policy. So when I talked about policy earlier, I said, what is five things basically? It's a plan. It's a plan that's then written down so it can be communicated or people can be educated on it. So then it can then be enforced. But then the last bit is that it should sometimes be able to be changed. So if a policy is created that is not useful in the future or a policy that doesn't address certain questions, we will revise that policy. And that because, that's because things change. And so policies need to change to adapt to the new situation. So you might make a plan to address a problem but if after the, the policy is enacted, you've got a new problem that that policy didn't cover, then you want to revise the policy. That's one way of thinking about policy. Here's another way of thinking about policy, the UN model, which is participation, first of all, in that, and that means that it's not just a small number of people making the decisions and creating the policy. You should be listening to a large number of voices, a large number of the, of the large percentage of the community that the policy is going to affect. There has to be accountability. So if the policy is not followed, and if the people who created the policy don't and don't enforce it properly, that we need to be make them accountable for that. It of course should not discriminate. So policies need to treat people equally, not dependent on their race or their class or their economic status. The ways that the policies get created should be transparent so that when they are communicated into the world, we understand how that policy was created. So it's making it clear that many people participated, that the government is remaining accountable to the policy and things. And then human dignity and empowerment, which should be part of all governmental processes, but then often aren't, is another key part of this. And that means just making sure that policies don't reduce people's personal stature or status in a community, and that policies help people become stronger, not make them weaker and more subject to the rules of the government. And then the last one is this question of rule of law. Policies are great, but unless they are enforced by the rule of law and follow the rule of law, then it's useless to enact a policy. So this is another model for understanding how policies 
should be created in the world, even though this is not the way they are, always are created in the world. And, you know, in places like George Brown, the policies that got created, none of you, very likely, I don't think, would have been involved in creating the policy around cannabis consumption or around uh, plagiarism or around any of the other policies in, say, the code of conduct. Those were established long before I came to George Brown, long before you came to George Brown. So in that case, we didn't participate, but we should be able to find out <clears throat> how that policy was created. And that's where things like transparency and accountability come in. So I'm gonna move past these slides on Vandana Shiva, but she is an interesting figure. Um, she's an activist in agriculture in India, but also around the world. Very, very uh, committed to this idea of biodiversity and the importance of biodiversity in food um, and in the environment generally. Uh, she is a founder of an organization called Navdanya, which is a network of seed, seed keepers. So she's very, very strong believer in preserving genetic material from the past and not relying on genetically modified foods. Um, and she is, uh, she's an, an, a very interesting figure, and there's a, there's a nice video there if you want to watch her. I met her once at a conference in Italy, and uh, she has great things to say, but she's a little bit, uh, but I would say she's quite uh, self-aware of her own importance. So she has quite a strong ego, which is a good thing in the world in some cases, and sometimes challenging. So policy in Canada, we talked a little bit about these things, didn't, there wasn't really an overarching national food policy for many, many years. And in about oh, 2006, 2008, somewhere in there, let's see, this organization that I just flashed by, there, Food Secure Canada. Food Secure Canada is actually it's an organization based in Montreal. And it's all about food security and making policy, or helping to inform policy decision making. Um, about food specifically. Uh, but for a very long time, Canada did not have a food policy that covered the whole country. It had food, it had policies that addressed agriculture and farming and trade and even nutrition and food safety. But it didn't have one policy that brought all of those things together in a holistic way. So they're very divided up and sometimes they the, the policies were part of different ministries or different governments sometimes federal, sometimes provincial. And so it was very incoherent and didn't allow for some of the major issues related to food in a global sense, didn't allow those policies, those issues to be addressed. And so Food Secure Canada worked very hard over a number of years to bring forward what they called the People's Food Policy for Canada. Um, it was not an official policy, but it was a policy that was created by having conversations with about 2,500 people across Canada over the course of two years. And they wrote out this massive document, which was then presented to the government of Canada. And in fact, in the last two years, a new food policy for Canada has actually been created. And Food Secure Canada's role in that was very significant because they actually raised a lot of the issues that the federal government would not have been able to put together themselves. And so that's where that idea of the Panther policy of inclusion and empowerment and having a lot of different voices made for a stronger policy. So Canada's food policy now addresses four main points and there's a lot of detail under each one. The first one is in increasing access to affordable food. So this is all, all has to do with food security, making sure that it is safe, nutritious, affordable and accessible to Canadian citizens. Then improving health and food safety. So making sure that it is possible to make good choices, making available choices there in places like supermarkets, but also all kinds of food markets. It also addresses environmental sustainability. So questions of conserving soil and water and air. And then the last major chunk, which is this one that we always debate around is growing more, more high quality food. And the question is, what does more mean? Why can't we deal with what we already have? Why do we need to grow more? So this food policy was created, but then there was a lot of criticism of it from different researchers and food and farmers and different kind of advocates, uh, including Food Secure Canada, who said, yeah, this is good, but it needs to be revised. And so again, we come back to this idea that food policies get created, 
get written, get communicated, get enforced, but definitely need to be revised over time because things change and conditions change and we get smarter at creating these policies over time. So this is not exactly in sequence, but yeah, okay. So at the, so I talked about levels of policy. At the level of Toronto, there is something called the Toronto Food Policy Council. And Toronto created its own set of standards and policies and plans for how food should be, how people should have access. And in some ways, they're very similar to the federal governmental level, but there's some differences too. So the right to that comes directly from the FAO. Healthy and sustainable, that's part of the Canadian food policy. That the food system itself, so the production systems, the farms, the agricultural processes should be sustainable. Um, but then two somewhat different aspects are food and reconciliation. And reconciliation is this word that we're now using in Canada to talk about improving the relationships between indigenous and non-indigenous communities. And as I've, I've talked about in the first couple of classes, historically, the colonial settlers who came to Canada treated the First Nations and native people of Canada very badly and often forced them off their land and into reservations and destroyed their ecosystems and built things like trains and cities on their land. And so over the history of Canada, there have been very bad relationships between uh, First Nations and uh, particularly the governments, but also non-Indigenous people in general. And so at the Toronto policy level, they've named food as one of the ways of increasing the, or improving these relationships of doing this process of reconciliation. And so that's different for Toronto in a way that is not, it's not the same as at the federal level. And then more voices at the table, and that again comes back to the FAO idea of, of the, the Panther principle for creating food policies or creating any policy in any sense, is that more voices make the policy stronger. The more you can include people in the planning process, the more perspectives and the more needs are going to be addressed by a policy makes it complicated. So this is, we're gonna come back to Toronto in a sec, but I just wanna look at this particular definition here, a food desert. We've talked about food insecurity in CSAs a bit, but the food desert really is just what it sounds like. It's a place where there's very little access to food, like in a desert, there's very little access to water. But the key thing, and it mostly occurs in cities, because in the country, it's a different context. But the issue is really this distance to healthful and fresh food. So a food desert is a geographic area where the people who live there don't have convenient access to fresh fruits and vegetables, so non-processed food. Um, and the distance generally associated with a food desert is one kilometer. So it means that if you live in a part of Toronto, where it's more than a kilometer to a grocery store that sells fresh food, you're living in a food desert. And that means that you don't have access or as much access as other people. Now, if you have a car, one kilometer isn't a big difference, di distance. But if you don't have a car, walking a kilometer can take 10, 15 minutes. And if you have any kind of mobility act, act issues, like if you have a hard time walking or if you're in a wheelchair, these are, that's a very long distance, especially if you have to carry the food back with you afterwards. So the sort of scary statistic is in Toronto, half of the population does not live within a kilometer of a grocery store. That means that half of the population is living in a food desert. And this is very common in a lot of big cities um, because cities, as they grow, don't always plan for the people who are moving in, into those cities to have access to fresh food within easy walking distance. But this is a necessary part of food security. And it's part of what's now becoming part of city-based food policies. So yeah, this is a problem. Once the buildings are built and there's no grocery stores in the neighborhood, what do you do? Well, there are some responses to these things. And so here's these slides show you a couple of those responses. One is this uh, organization Food Chair that created what they're calling a different kind of food truck. This food truck isn't selling tacos, it's selling fresh fruits and vegetables. 
And so you can see it's like a portable little mini farmer's market on wheels where it drives around to different neighborhoods, it parks in some parking lot somewhere, and it sells fresh fruits and vegetables, particularly to people who live in food deserts. That's one solution. Here's another solution that was come up with in Regent Park in Toronto, where this space was basically established as a kind of outdoor food court. It's not the same as fresh fruits and vegetables, but these, these people, these what they're calling homegrown retailers, were able to make food. In this case, it looks like some salads and some soups and some casseroles of different kinds um, and different foods that have been prepared and then, then being sold into one of these neighborhoods that was previously thought of as a food desert um, and addressing this issue of food insecurity in the urban environment. There are other organizations like Green Thumbs, which teach kids how to grow food and seeds of diversity, which is like Navdanya, which is about saving seeds and sharing seeds so that you can grow food that's not genetically modified in urban environments, particularly on rooftop gardens and community gardens and places inside the city. And another example of an urban response to a food desert is the Moss Park Market. So again, I've got a short video. It's uh, just, just over two minutes long. And it's a report on CTV News from a number of years ago talking about this Moss Park Market. And so I'm gonna share the link with you again. I'd like you to watch this. We'll come back as a group afterwards. But as you're watching the video, Think about how Toronto's food policy needed to be either changed or rewritten in some way to make it possible for this market to exist. And so just think about how policy may have affected the creation of this little market. So there's the link in the chat right now. I will turn off my uh, audio and video again and we'll regroup in about three minutes and talk about this video.
Okay, so hoping, assuming that you've seen that video now, um, where did you see an example of some 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 piece of policy that either needed to be created or that already created that allowed this market to exist? What do you think? How did policy play a role in the creation of Moss Park Market? <clears throat> Yeah, so really, so access to fresh food. This is this is part of the idea of um, accessibility within food. So the right to food builds in this idea of having access to it. What kinds of policies do you think might have, might not have existed that needed to be created for this to be here? Think about city policies around commercial establishments what kind of policies would the city either needed did the city need to create or that this, this market needed to fit within any ideas yeah i'm saying public space so what about public space Salvador, what do you mean by pay? <laughs> this is where chat doesn't work quite so well. I will interpret, maybe. Um, so indeed, yeah, OK. So this is going in, yeah, it's going into a high-rise, low-income neighborhood. Um, we saw that the, the market was actually located in a parking lot, in a residential parking lot, right? So ordinarily, a city policy would designate certain areas as commercial areas and some of them as residential areas. It's very likely that they put the, the, the parking lot for this residential area was never zoned for commercial activity. So either they had to get a, a special permit to sell food in a non-commercial area, or the city might have changed its policy or ignored its policy to allow the market to be put up there. The building um, owners, too, if it's the city or a private owner, they would have had policies as well about who can park in their parking lot. And so if they're, if, you know, ordinarily those parking spaces would be reserved for the residents of the building. But if you're putting in this, these two shipping containers, you're occupying parking spaces. And so you have to change the policy of the residential space in order to allow for that that market to exist. Um, there might have been other policies that were that were in place or that needed to be changed. Like we heard that there was, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, electricity, of course, going to that public market. So they would have lighting and air conditioning and ventilation. So maybe there needed to be some policy change about allowing a shipping container to have access to electricity in the city of Toronto. And we saw that there was a, a ramp leading up to the front door to make it accessible to people in wheelchairs. And that's certainly a policy that's in place in Toronto, um, throughout Ontario, is that commercial establishments have to be accessible to people with reduced mobility or who are in wheelchairs. So they got the wheelchair ramp built, but that was because they had to follow the policy um, that was already in place. So throughout all of that, little short busy video we saw the policy was was invisible but it absolutely was necessary in order for this market to exist yeah and then as Jesse was pointing out the um, the market itself had set a policy of having food at the most affordable price so although they had to actually make some profit in order to keep this business running they also didn't want to overcharge the people it was more was on the edge of being a nonprofit organization. Um, and it's in fact created by a nonprofit organization. But they have to make enough profit to do all the things like pay for electricity. So there's some interesting big policies, Canadian policy in terms of access to food, policy at the city level, and then policy at the institutional level as well. Yeah, and as David's pointing out, it's a it's a really successful 
uh, big win for uh, not too much change. And it really suggests that within what seems like a city structure or a provincial structure of policies, that there's no room for innovation. But of course, there always is. And this is a good example of that. Uh, so another another example I will go go over quite quickly, but Black Creek Community Farm, it's farmland in the city. So you can see in this map at uh, Jane and Finch, basically, I think. Is that the right direction? Yeah. Um, very densely populated neighborhood. Uh, not, but certainly parts of it, very much food deserts. Um, and so what they've done is they've created this urban farm where people can not only learn to grow vegetables, but then come together in communities a bit like the, the community food center, and, um, and then also learn how to grow, learn how to harvest, learn how to process, and learn how to cook those fresh fruits and vegetables. All right, so a couple of, I'm gonna go through these, these last slides very quickly. Again, you can come back to them. They may be useful in the checklist assignment, but there are a lot of, um, a lot of themes related to food, uh, particularly having to do with water, and salmon or, or GMO, sorry, GMO labeling when it comes to food and policy. Um, <clears throat> the first one is having to do with water, not only in Canada, but around the world. Water is uh, incredibly wastefully used in agriculture. Um, it's also just a very in water intensive industry. Um, obviously, farms need water, uh, whether it's rain coming down from the sky or underground waterways or irrigation from a municipal water system. Water is huge in everything to do with food and incredibly, um, uh, just an incredibly intensive uh, resource, or intensively used resource. Um, and this has become very problematic in a lot of places in the world where water is drying up because of overuse, because of increased salination, because of rising sea levels. Um, and where water sometimes just runs out, like it did last year in certain parts of South Africa, and people were limited to maybe two or three liters of water a day. So not nearly enough water to flush a toilet or have a shower, barely to cook with, um, just enough maybe to keep yourself drinking the required amount daily. So this is a real issue, water, all around the world. And without policies, because it's a common resource, without policies, um, a lot of people mostly industrial folks, will take more than their share of water. And as you may have heard at some point, um, oh, where was it? I think it was west coast of Canada. So in British Columbia, some, probably Coca-Cola or Pepsi, one of the big water, bottled water companies, was using the water from Canada to be packaged and then sold into uh, United States. So it was a very weird political battle over who owned the rights to that water and whether water should be owned at all. But this is where policies are important in terms of protecting, particularly as you saw in this briefly in this first slide, in terms of protecting um, societies and communities that have uh, very limited water supplies and particularly in places like the north of Canada, where they're often exposed to chemical contaminants from either mining operations or forestry operations. And right now, <coughs> excuse me, huge problem for many of the First Nations in Canada, where they have limited access to water, it's either from lakes and rivers or from wells, but that water is very often poisoned by the industrial operations around them. And because they're First Nations who have historically been underserved by governmental policies, a lot of these places have boil water advisories and have had them in place for like 30 years. So it's not just, oh, this week the water is no good to drink. It's been going on for decades. And slowly this is being addressed by the government of Canada. But it's a huge issue for First Nations who just don't have water. So some, as you can see in the, the lower image, this is a water filtration system that's been put into place in, uh, it's a portable water filtration system that's been put into place in certain communities. But you can also see in this picture, the water there is yellow. And very few people want to drink yellow water because you don't know what's in it. In fact, you probably know what terrible things are in it. But then in a lot of urban, or sorry, in a lot of rural communities where uh, fracking for natural gas is going on, fracking being a mining operation 
that explodes rock underground and then extracts the gas that was trapped there. Places where fracking is going on, people's water is often contaminated not by chemicals, or it's a kind of chemical, but contaminated by natural gas. So if you take water from your tap and put it in a, in a water jug or in a, in a milk jug with a top on it, and you shake it, and then you take off the cap, you can actually light the gas that comes off of the water because it's so contaminated with the natural gas from this oil, from this gas fracking process. So water has become a big issue because all of the industrial processes that we are creating in the world, all the resource extraction processes, are really damaging our water supplies and sometimes making them run out. So then the other issue that I want to highlight here is genetically modified food. Um, so there is a there's a video you, you can look at. It's a trailer for this this video called Modified. It's it's not the greatest trailer in the world, but it does highlight some of the issues. So the link is there in the in the in the slides if you want to go back and look at it later. But we eat currently, we grow and eat a lot of genetically modified foods in Canada. Um, one of the first ones was salmon. Uh, we started genetically modifying salmon with different genes from, for example, tomatoes and vice versa to improve the growth rates of salmon. Same thing for all sorts of products, corn and soy and canola, which is a seed, an oil seed, um, squash, sugar beets, all of these foods are genetically modified um, very frequently in agriculture in Canada. And this is a big issue because we have been only genetically modifying foods for a short amount of time. And while we know that sometimes they interbreed with other wild plants or other non-genetically modified plants, so that's a kind of biological contamination, we also don't really know about the long-term health effects, either in one person's lifetime or over multiple generations, just because we haven't been eating genetically modified foods for that long. So this is one of the real challenges about about eating, growing and eating genetically modified foods. Yes, it might produce more food. Yes, it might produce food that's uh, more resistant to pests or rot, or uh, they might ripen the foods faster. But we also don't really know about the long-term health benefits. And there are lots of organizations, including, let's see if we can find it, including Aqua Bounty, which is raising genetically modified salmon, and they claim they are sustainable and safe and delicious and inexpensive. Um, but this is also based on their own research. And as we talked about in the first couple of classes, you always have to be a bit wary of research results that are biased or that are based on some motivation from a specific company. Last little detail um, also about policies and the lack of policies around certain food processes. Most potatoes in Canada are irradiated. Irradi irradiation um, helps uh, prevent spoilage. It can help control insects or other or viruses or diseases. Uh, and at the same time, we're not entirely sure what the long-term health effects are of eating irradiated food. We certainly know that radiation is very bad for the human body. Um, if it's directly exposed, <clears throat> we're not so sure what it would mean uh, to eat food on a long-term basis that's been irradiated. Does it make the food radioactive? Probably not. That can be measured. Does it cause other changes in the food? Well, it does, and that's part of the reason it's used, because it creates some positive, some benefits. But does it create any negatives? Hmm, unsure. But this is another thing to be aware of is that there's no labeling right now for irradiated foods. You buy your potatoes, and this label is not necessarily on them. So one of the issues about food and policy and new practices is about making sure that food that's subjected to specific kinds of treatments like irradiation or pesticides or genetic modification is labeled so that at least we have the information as consumers and can make choices about whether or not to buy that food. So that is policy for now. And we will move on to the question of profit and how to make a profit sustainably. 
But um, just before going on, any questions or comments about uh, about policy and about why policy is either interesting or boring or complicated or important when it comes to food and yeah, fatigue? One question that though, according to the UN, we have enough food for everybody, but in case there is a natural disaster like water scarcity, nobody can grow parties in this way. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Well. Yeah, so according to the UN and according to almost all research that's ever been done on international food systems, there's enough food. We grow enough food every year uh, to feed the planet. Now, we may not grow the kind of food that everybody wants to eat. And so that is one issue. Um, and that's a separate issue from your current question. Uh, but if there's a natural disaster, well, or if there are situations like what we're in right now, which is a kind of natural disaster, if we can't grow enough food, then is genetically modified food the solution? Well, it's a very good question. Um, in the short term, it might be part of a hybrid solution. So one solution is definitely um, wasting less and distributing better. Then you may, might add into that things like GM food that requires less water. You might not. You might add into that more low production. You might in, add into that more water conservation policies that need to be created. You might into it, add into it a lot of things. And probably as we grow as a population on this planet, the true solution will be many solutions, not just one. So it's not going to be just about growing more food or growing GM food or growing local food or growing small scale. It has to be maybe all of these things together. The issue is really with genetic, mod genetic modification is we just don't understand the long-term benefits or hazards of GM food. And some research will say genetically modified food isn't that much better in terms of ripening, productivity, water usage. There's lots of science that says that it is, but there's also science that says that it isn't. And you have to then be very critical of both sides of that to understand who paid for the research, what motivations are underlying that, that research, um, what are the biases that are built into the research, including by the scientists themselves. And it's not about, it's not about um, giving up on science. It's about doubting the motivations, which are very often corporate based, behind the research that says either GM food is great or GM food is prob problematic. Does that answer the question? Sort of. Great. Any other questions? Yeah. If we're growing too much food, why can't why don't we help the people that can't afford buying it? Well, because food is power. Um, so there are a few, there are a bunch of different things. So if you're going into a very conflicted uh, uh, area of the planet, <clears throat> for example, Sudan. Um, has been a location of a great deal of war and conflict, very often over natural resources, um, things like oil and gold and diamonds and all those things that have a lot of economic value. So wars are often created over the control of resources. Wars are sometimes created over different ideologies. In any case, in a war zone, uh, movement is limited. And so getting people in and out, getting food in and out is a real issue. So that's one of the reasons why we often see famine associated with war and refugees perpetually moving, living in large refugee camps where the food infrastructure isn't there in the first place, where people are hungry, people are frightened, making strange decisions. There's an awful lot of <clears throat> bad decisions that get made, an awful lot of decisions that can't be enacted. So we've got the food, but we can't get it to them because of that conflict situation. One example. Another example is <clears throat> food aid from wealthy countries like the United States and Canada is a tool for creating political change or creating political relationships. And so food is often traded for other kinds of power. And if a country doesn't have some kind of power to return to the country that's giving the food, they may not receive the food aid. So just because the food is there, we can get it to them. It might not be sent to them. 
because that country doesn't really have anything to offer in return. And so that's where we get into the very complicated politics of international food aid. And it's one of the reasons that a lot of people go hungry, even though there's plenty of food available. So it has to do with politics. It has to do with all the systems of, of power that exist in the world between different countries. It has to do with war and accessibility. It has to do with a lot of things. And then sometimes food is delivered to a place, but that food is not what those people eat. And so it's just, it's like meaningless. It's like delivering, as I, I think I said in some class, delivering a lot of corn to a rice eating community. They'll look at that corn and say, oh, that's, that's animal food. That's not food for humans. And in fact, that's happened many times in all sorts of countries where there's food, but it's just not considered worthy of human consumption. And so people go hungry rather than eating that food that doesn't seem like food to them. So lots and lots of reasons <clears throat> why there might be enough food, but it's not getting into people's bodies. Hope that answers your question. Okay, uh, profit. Yeah, you're welcome. <clears throat> um, so we've got a couple of little exercises to do in this section, including the in-class exercise that I mentioned. Um, so I will go relatively quickly through profit. <clears throat> it's a bit more straightforward than policy, so we don't need to spend quite as much time on it. But again, if you have questions, let me know. So in this section, we're going to actually start with a quick little exercise. It should only take three or four minutes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what I'm going to ask you to do is answer these quiz questions um, in a Word document or a Google Doc, something that you can email to me because I want, to, I want to be able to receive it and then mark it and give you a grade. I'm not going to submit it through Blackboard because that's just too challenging right now. But um, so I'm going to, on the next slide, I'll show you the questions and I'll give you about three or five minutes to answer those questions and right away email it to me um, so that I can then give you your grades back by, the, by next week. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty straightforward. Now, for those of you who have done the pledge assignment, and there are a couple of you, this is where you can make the decision to either do the quiz, uh, spend the five minutes, or not. So with your pledge, if you've done the pledge assignment, I will grade it, and you will get a mark for that pledge assignment. However, you can also do this quiz and the other assignments in the next two classes. And if your mark on those is higher than your pledge assignment, I'll give you the higher mark. So this is an opportunity to just do a little bit of extra work, possibly for a slightly higher grade. Up to you, it's your choice, um, but what I'm offering. If you haven't written the pledge assignment, then you do have to do these in-class in assignments. Uh, is that clear? Does anybody have any questions about what I just said? Thank you, Rodolfo. Great, okay. Excellent. Thank you. If you do have any questions, pose them now. Um, so I'll go on to the next slide. So you can do this. You can actually just type it into the email, or you can write up a Word document or a, any kind of document at all and then email it to me. I will drop my email address in the chat again, so you've got it right there. Um, my email address <clears throat> and as soon as you've written the quiz answers just pop it off to me and then we'll go on with the class so the questions are we've just talked policy list four key elements that are involved in creating a policy we've talked about a lot of different policy different policy elements then write a one sentence description in your own words of sustainability, please don't go back and cut and paste the definition from other slides. Just what does it mean to you and, and, and how would you describe it in one sentence? And then name five different kinds of sustainability. And so those can just be one word answers, but five different kinds. So four key elements of a policy, probably about four words or maybe short phrases, one sentence for sustainability, and five words to name different kinds of sustainability. 
Any questions on those? Good. Go for it, and, and I'll start the clock now. And as soon as you've uh, finished up, just shoot it off to me in an email. So the, the last part on uh, different kinds of sustainability. We've talked about sustainability from a lot of different perspectives in this class. There are different, what I would call different kinds of sustainability. Um, the one that we often think about the most is environmental sustainability. But there are many different kinds. And so what I'm asking you now is to name some of those other kinds of sustainability. That is how sustainability can be understood in different ways uh, because of what it affects. Hope that answers your question.
Okay, we're at about five minutes. If you need more time, just raise your hand. Okay, great. We'll give you another couple of minutes. Do you have a question, Pratik? Maybe. No worries. Okay, so wherever you are with the responses, just shoot that off to me in an email and we'll continue on with the class. <clears throat> so far I've got three.
Okay, I think I've got most of them now, so I'm just going to go on. <clears throat> Do shoot that off to me as soon as you can, and I will uh, keep going with the slides. <clears throat> so one of the challenges with sustainability that we're always bumping up against is the idea that if you're sustainable, you're not going to make a profit. And this is one of the big challenges that we have to overcome, both sort of psychologically and in terms of the kind of ways that we understand what profit really is based on. So the first, <coughs> to me, the first part of that is really exemplified by this, this story in Fast Company, the business magazine. And the point is that sustainability doesn't mean less profit, it means profit over the long term. And generally that's, you know, you can understand that in theory, but psychologically and in terms of business models, we are very often driven to make as much profit as we can as quickly as possible. And this is where profit and sustainability start coming into conflict. Because if you make tons of profit right away, um, right. All right, if you make tons of profit right away, um, it can mean that you're undermining your long-term sustainability and therefore undermining your long-term profitability. The simple example is the business that is really exploitative and charges a lot of money and pays their employees very badly and makes a ton of profit in the first year is more likely to go out of business in the second or the third year because one, they don't have a customer base that's loyal and believes in them. And two, they're gonna develop a reputation for being a bad employer and people won't wanna work for them. Now then there are other kinds of unsustainable business practices like waste um, and like things, simple things like recycling and composting. And eventually over time, not being sustainable will mean that your business probably isn't going to last. It isn't gonna survive. So you can imagine say, that you make a million dollars of profit in your first year as a food truck owner. That's not gonna happen likely, but maybe. But if that business isn't around in 10 years, you'll be making no profit in 10 years. So imagine you make you could make a million dollars in one year, or you could make $500,000 over the course of a number of different years, over the course of maybe six years or 10 years. So in that case, you make a million dollars in one year, but then you go out of business. Or you make a million dollars and you start undermining your own profitability by being a bad business. So you might not last for many years. So maybe you make a couple million dollars in the first two or three years, but then you go out of business. What if you're making $500,000 because you're putting some of your profit towards more sustainable practices? And then you're around for six years or 10 years or 20 years, and you're only making $500,000 a year in profit, but over a course of 10 years, you've made $5 million instead of one or $2 million. And that's the, the very simplified version of sustainable profit. But the idea is basically, you're not around, you can't make a profit. And increasingly, as I said in the first class, food businesses have to pay attention to sustainability, not because it's good for the world, but because consumers are paying more and more attention to sustainability. And if you don't, as a food professional, give them what they want, they'll go to some other business that is saying that we do sustainability better. So partly about being competitive, and it's also partly about being realistic about the future of food businesses. We've been getting along very well being unsustainable for the past 200 years, but it is coming to an end this year, well, this decade maybe, this, this century definitely. Um, so we've got to change our ways or we're just not gonna be there in the future. So that's the one side of, of sustainable um, and profit. And in these slides, there's some kind of obvious things, but they're just there for your reference. And when we talk about profit, we're talking about basically what's left over after your operating expenses and your income has come in. Um, but in a more complex sense, we've got 
these two different terms here on the slides, neoclassical rule and constant capital rule. And the first one, neoclassical rule, is this idea where we, in which we use the environment as a source of inputs, as a source of resources, natural resources, for example, ingredients, but anything else, water, petroleum. And then we also use that same environment as a dumping ground for our waste. And that's what Annie Leonard described in The Story of Stuff as the linear extraction through waste chain of production. So extraction, transformation, retail, consumption, and waste. And that linear system follows the neoclassical rule where we just take the planet as a source of resources and a place to dump our garbage. And that doesn't work. It's clearly, it's getting worse and worse over time. It never really worked, but for a long time, we weren't noticing that it was a problem. Now it's pretty clear that that's not a model that works. So instead, what we're trying to move towards, particularly in food production, is this idea of constant capital rule. And constant capital means um, that the, the principal resource, that's what I'll call you know, the principal or the core resource, isn't depleted over time. And we, whoever the we is, only uses the stuff that's produced in surplus annually. So there are two examples of this that I'll give. One is a bank account, which is the very simple one. Say, for example, you had $1 million. Let's see if I can do this quickly. $1 million. Wouldn't it be nice to have $1 million? So if you have $1 million and you just start spending it, you spend, say, $100,000 a year, in the first year, you'll have $900,000 left, and then $800,000, and then $700,000. And that's more of the constant capital rule model. Sorry, no, I apologize. Sorry, that's more of the neoclassical rule model. So you're imagining, in this case, the, hundred, the $1 million is the planet. It's your source of resources. And if you just keep extracting from that, eventually you'll have zero left. And if you keep dumping your waste, it's not just zero dollars, but you have zero dollars and maybe a lot of debt. So that's one model. That's the neoclassical rule model describing a bank account with a millions in it where you're just spending. If instead you put that million dollars into, let's get rid of that. Instead, you put the million dollars into a bank account that was getting, say, 3% interest every year. That would mean that every year you'd have $30,000 to spend without depleting your $1 million. So at the end of the first year, you haven't spent, you spent $30,000, but your million dollars is still in the bank account, in the savings. And then the next year, you only spend the $30,000, and the year after that, and year after that. But that means that your million dollars lasts forever, and you've just used only the interest to support yourself in whatever way. That's more of the constant capital rule. So that's the bank example for constant capital rule. But if you're thinking in terms of the environment of sustainability, for example, you might say, all right, I've got an apple orchard, and I've got 100 trees. And what I will do in the constant capital rule model is I will harvest and sell the apples that grow on those trees every year. And that's the equivalent of the 3% interest. You could also cut down some of those trees and sell the apple wood for profit to a building company or to a company that likes using apple wood for smoking its sausages. But if you keep heading down those trees, you will eliminate the reef that's producing your apples. And eventually, you'll have no trees and no apples. So these, again, are very simple versions of the constant capital rule model of economics. But if you think about that in terms of the bigger scale of the planet, it means producing food in a way in which the primary resource remains intact. What does that mean? That means the soil, the air, the water, and the source of seeds. So it means you're not buying new seeds every year. You're not buying new fertilizer every year you're preserving the resource. You're making sure that the soil stays fertile. You're making sure that the water is not becoming salinated. 
You're making sure that the seeds are savable from year to year. And you're only living off what that system produces and not depleting the primary resource. And that's very fundamental to sustainability, but it's also connected to this idea of profit. You could make more profit, maybe, by using a lot more purchased resources like, like uh, pesticides and fertilizers. You could make more profit by cutting down the apple trees, but you wouldn't necessarily have a long-term and sustainable source of income. And so that's where this idea about sustainability and profit start making more sense together, even though it might seem counterintuitive at the beginning. <clears throat> so this then leads us also into this concept of externalities. And I'm going to show you a video. Um, I'm going to have you look at a video. Uh, once again, I will drop it into the chat. And this is a video in which the uh, food writer and scholar Raj Patel is talking about what he calls the true cost of a hamburger. And so listen to what he's saying about how much the hamburger costs the consumer, say four or five dollars, but how much the hamburger is actually costing to the entire system that's producing it. And this is the key question that we'll come back to with externalities. So I think this is about a four minute video. Yep, four minute video. Watch it, and then we'll come back and debrief quickly, and I'll explain what I mean by externalities. So there is the link in uh, the chat, and I'm going to turn off my microphone and video, and we'll come back again in four minutes.
So hopefully you've now seen that video. <clears throat> He's a, yeah, Raj a fascinating guy. Actually, there's another book. This one, I don't know if you can see it, called Stuffed and Starved that he wrote, which was uh, an earlier book, uh, but very, very much what it says is that half of the world is overfed, and, well, not half the world, but a large part, portion of the world is overfed, and a large portion is underfed. And so there's this weird thing where too many, some people have too much food, some people have too little food. Um, so he's very good at, I think, communicating things like that, and that's what's so notable about this this video is this, this idea of the four or the five dollar hamburger, where it's actually really two hundred dollars. Um, it's just not us who's paying that; it's someone else. So it might be because the meat or the or the grains or the tomatoes have been produced with slave labor, which doesn't cost as much as properly paid labor, or it pays nothing. Um, and so there's a cost there, but it's just not accounted for in the actual cost, in the actual price tag, as he says, of the burger. And that's the key thing that the food system is completely full of. We have government subsidies, we have unfair labor practices, we have exploitation, we have the use of other people's labor and other people's land, and all those things allow food to be inexpensive to the consumer, but not inexpensive to the whole system. So one of those key things that he also mentioned was healthcare costs. We eat the burger, it may not have cost actually $200 to make all the ingredients, including the labor, but over the course of that burger's extended lifetime, it's costing the whole system additional dollars because of the, the health effects of eating not just one burger, obviously, but hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of burgers, and it's not just burgers. Eating bad food over the course of our lifetime makes us more susceptible to illness, disease, and, and long-term health issues that need healthcare dollars. So the burger costs more because it's causing a lot of effects in the world, not just because of the ingredients that it's made out of. And that's where we get to this idea <clears throat> on the current slide of the, the word externality. So the, an externality is anything that is not accounted for in the final cost of something, for example, a hamburger or anything. Any situation that doesn't account for waste, doesn't account for exploitation, that doesn't account for the hidden costs of healthcare, that doesn't account for all the petroleum or water that has gone into that food product or that, that system, anything there, that's an externality. And that makes us create a false understanding of profit. So if you sell a burger for $5 and the ingredients cost you two, you're making a profit of three. But if you're making a profit of three for yourself, who is suffering? Who is not getting something somewhere along the production chain? That's where we have to re-understand profitability as not just cost of ingredients subtracted from the cost of sales, but actually thinking about the whole system. And this is where paying into sustainability can help you make your business more sustainable in the long term because you've actually accounted for some of those extra days. So the idea with externalities is if you bring them in to the system, you transform the system from a linear system, like is described in the story of stuff, into what's more of a circular or closed loop system, where we're actually doing what's called true cost accounting. So true cost accounting, just this slide sort of says it all, it takes into account hidden costs, those externalities, by demonstrating them on sort of the imaginary balance book of your business. And that includes everything, environmental costs, health costs, transportation, labor costs, everything. So externalities, another part of this whole process. So <clears throat> we've got just a few more minutes. Um, I want to go through very quickly this slide, not to spend much time on it, but as a resource for you for your check assignment. We need to answer some questions about that as well. Um, think about this particularly for the mission statement that is part of your checklist assignment. So as you'll recall, the checklist assignment means you're coming up with a food business that you'd like to maybe create someday. And then you're 
writing a mission statement or a statement that you will stick to in terms of sustainability. Now, mission statements vary very much from different businesses, from one business to another and from one person to another. Some of the things to think about in writing your mission statement for your food business is to think about critically what that mission statement actually means. Who does it have an impact on? Uh, what's implicated in your saying, I will create X, Y, Z, I will be sustainable. Well, how? How is it going to be sustainable and why? And what's your bias towards sustainability that should be shown in that mission statement and not be hidden by the mission statement? So it's also about using clear language and avoiding buzzwords so that the mission statement becomes meaningful, not just to you, but to your colleagues, to your partners, to your bosses, to your employees, and most of all, to your consumers. You want the mission statement to be meaningful to them uh, because that's part of your positioning for this business. So there are some examples. Um, you can find these links. Uh, I will show you very briefly right now. One of the useful resources uh, here we go, is this page on LinkedIn, which is the link that is in that slide. And this is a bunch of different mission statements related to sustainability that this particular person has researched and then made some comments about. And some of these mission statements can be understood as being honest and meaningful, and some of them you might want to be more critical of. So Adidas, the shoe company, do they care about environmental sustainability? Apparently they do. Do they care about financial rewards? Apparently they do. So it goes through a bunch of different ones, including Starbucks. Starbucks shared planet is our commitment to do business in ways that are good for people and the planet. All right, well, what does that actually mean? It's a very simple statement. It's maybe one that you can buy into, but when you look behind it, what, what does it actually mean? So these are just some examples you can look at um, as you're doing your, uh, what's it called, your uh, checklist assignment. And then there's some others. on the slide. So these are some more food specific mission statements. So Diana Seafood and Hooked, two different food or fishing um, fishing producers, fish producers. So you can read those and compare them. What does what do they say to you? And then some food suppliers as well, GFS and Cisco and 100 Kilometer Foods. So these are just to give you some examples of how to think about shaping your own mission statement for your food business for the checklist assignment. Uh, one other tool, again, share it quickly with you, is this Global Footprint Calculator. It might be a useful tool for you while you are preparing your checklist assignment. Um, I'll show the screen to you again. And it's, you know, it's kind of fun. It's a sort of interactive app, and it allows you to go through different uh, food practices and determine how, uh, how sustainable or how, how much of a footprint you have on the planet. So in this case, this is about meat. How much do I eat? Do I eat meat very often or less often? And then you can add some details and see how your consumption of, say, pork or beef and lamb or poultry affects your overall footprint. So this might be another tool that you use as you're trying to figure out how to think about sustainability for your checklist. And <clears throat> okay. All right, we've got one final exercise. I just want to uh, see if there's anything else I want to share with you right now. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, one other slide here. Again, in the slides on, on uh, Blackboard, just some more resources that are maybe useful or interesting to you as you're getting towards your checklist assignment. Restaurant supported agriculture, much like community supported agriculture, is a system in which restaurants buy directly from farmers. They buy a share of the farm's output and, uh, and the farm while also having a guaranteed supply over the year. A few other food suppliers there that are listed that might be interesting for you to look at as you're preparing your checklist assignment. Um, so 
really what I'd like to do for the checklist assignment is just ask you what um, what are your questions about it? I went through it in class on uh, two weeks ago uh, in quite a lot of detail, I think. But are there still questions that you have about how and what you're supposed to be doing? This will be your time to pose those questions. No questions. I feel like someone at the beginning of the class said, hey, can we talk about the checklist assignment? Who was that? Ah, Pratik, yeah. What, do you have a question that was that I can answer right now? And if you want to just do it out loud, oh, you missed that class. Ah, okay. Um, why don't you and I chat afterwards? Um, if you go back to the to Blackboard to the Blackboard Collaborate page, at the top of that is uh, just says Course Room Unlocked. And if you click on that room, I'll be in that room after the class, and you and I can just have a, a conversation about what that uh, assignment is supposed to look like. Does that work? Great. Okay. And of course, anybody else who wants to ask questions about the checklist assignment, just come find me in that shared classroom um, when after we've shut down this class um, and ask any questions you have. You can also, of course, always email me and I'll respond by email. All right. So the very last last thing that we've got to do, surprisingly, this class went longer than the regular class. All right. And this is a bit of a game. But it's also an illustration about uh, sharing a common resource. So <coughs> this is a real chance for you to get bonus points added to your final grade. Um, the challenge, though, is you're going to have to um, trust each other and be fair in your choices. So I'm going to ask you to do is pick the number of bonus points that you want. Do you want zero, two, or six bonus points? Now the obvious answer is six. However, in the rules of this game, if more than 10% of the class chooses 6%, then no one gets any bonus points. In this case, we've got 10 people in the room. So if more than one of you chooses 6%, you're all gonna get zero. If someone chooses 6%, but someone else chooses 0%, that 0% will neutralize that 6%, and it won't be considered in the total number of people who chose 6%. So say, for example, five people choose 6%, but four people choose 0%, it'll knock down those five people into one person, so if you're altruistic and you choose zero, you might help the class get some bonus points, but you'll get zero. If you're selfish and you choose six and someone else chooses six, then the whole class suffers by getting zero. If, however, you choose 2% and no more than one person chooses 6%, then everyone will get their 2%. So this is the this is the challenge. This is the the question. How much do you trust your colleagues to be selfless or selfish? So what I'm going to ask you to do right now is pick zero, two, or six percent, and message me privately in the chat which one you want, and I'll give you all the results at the in, in the next class. So uh, don't talk amongst yourselves. Don't talk in the common chat. Just go into the chat panel and then select my name. So you, uh, I don't know if you can do it. Can you do a direct message? Maybe not. Is that private? Yeah, that looks private. Or is it? Yeah, that was private. Okay, so Bailey, you just figured out how to send me a private message. So everyone send me a private message. Um, 
saying whether you want zero, two, or six percent points. And but remember, if everybody picks six, everyone gets zero. In fact, if two people pick six, everyone gets zero. Or you can be strategic and pick zero and hope that you neutralize one of those six percenters. Anyway, anyone have any questions about this? Okay, thanks, Davis. Thanks, Pratik. Thanks, Bailey. Thanks, David. Green. Okay, uh, so I'll explain it again, uh, Miriam. So you're you're basically the, the thing you have to do right now is tell me whether you would like to have zero, two, or six percent bonus points. But the challenge is, um, or the, the, the problem is, if um, I'm gonna I'm gonna look at what the whole class has chosen, and if more than one of you picks six percent. Um, everyone gets zero. If um, someone picks zero and someone else has picked six, that one person who picked zero effectively knocks out the person who picked six. So it brings, it makes it more likely that people will get their bonus points. If you all pick 2%, you'll all get 2%. If one of you wants to risk it and pick 6%, and everyone else picks a six, pick six, sorry, everyone else picks two, then everyone gets two and that one person gets six. However, if two of you think that you can get away with taking more than your fair share, then everyone gets zero. Now I'm not gonna tell who the people are who chose what, so no one will get blamed, but you will know that you were the one who caused everyone in the class to grow, including you. Does that explain it, Norm? Thanks for that. Great. So it is, you know, it's it's a weird little game of trust and 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 sharing. Well, it's to illustrate um, it's to illustrate what happens when we take more than our fair share. Um, the very, you know, the simple example is imagine you're in your house with your family, and you rack a dozen oranges. And uh, you put them on the kitchen table. And uh, sorry, wait a minute, I'm just trying to write down a note. Uh, you put down the bowl of oranges on the kitchen table, and they're enough so that everybody can take two. You know, six people in the family, dozen oranges. Um, but someone decides, ah, I want six. I don't want to take two, I want to take six. And that only leaves six oranges left for the other five people in the family. Is that fair? Well, no. And if two people did that, two people took six of those oranges, then there would be zero left for the rest of the family. So this is where we, it's about making decisions in the best interest of the group. Okay, I think I've got two more people I'm waiting to get a response from, I'm not sure. I'm just waiting to find out if everybody's responded. I think I'm missing two people. I can tell you this week, actually. That sounds so it won't be hard to do the math. I'm missing one. So Jesse, I don't think I have yours yet, and Malika, I don't have yours yet. Thank you.
Uh, did you? Can you send it again? Sorry, I don't think I don't seem to have it in my uh, in my chat. Or did you email me? Oh, yes. Okay, I have it. I have it in my email. Never mind. All right. So the results are in. Oh, this is very interesting. Um, okay, so this is rare. What's happened, and this is kind of exciting, what's happened is that um, only one person chose six. So it's below the 10%, or it's within 10%. However, that one person, who will remain nameless, um, someone else chose zero. So they knocked out your six. Um, which means that the person who chose zero gets zero, but the person who chose six also gets zero because you got knocked out by one altruistic person. Everyone else chose two, so you will all get your two bonus points except for those two people who chose the six and the zero. So in this case, it's a very, very unusual outcome. Almost always, more than 10% of the population chooses six and then everyone gets zero. But in this case, um, that's been turned on its end. So anyway, thank you for playing. I like this as a result. I'm sorry for the six person, but uh, congratulations to the zero person for uh, making a very clever and strategic play. Um, <laughs> that's it for now. I really do take care of yourselves. Um, it's been nice to be here together with you, even though we're not really face to face. It's uh, a good bit of connection. And I hope you continue that with your other classes. Uh, if you need anything, let me know, because uh, we're around. Oh, really? OK. So Davis is saying last year it was uh, different. That's good. So yeah, good work to all of you. And keep it up. Let me know if you have any questions. I'm going to hang out in the other classroom for a little while that's uh, available on Blackboard Connect. It's called or Blackboard Collaborate. It's called Course Room. So I'll be in there. I'll also be posting the recording of this uh, class uh, on a YouTube video linked to from uh, from somewhere on Blackboard, which I will make an announcement about. Do keep your eyes on the announcements in case things change. And by next week, I'm hoping there will be more information about the exam. And in any case, we will figure it out from there. Take care of yourselves. See you around. Bye.